yeah, and, and then I, I was literally penny, yeah, penniless because I had uh, massively over leveraged myself, which is yeah. So I went to yeah, no job, no savings, and so I had to start again. I hate to say this, but it is a rite of passage. If you're getting into trading investing, there are certain things you have to have done until you can become a, an experienced trader. You need to be scammed. For a newbie coming on right now, I like anything, I would say spend a minimum, an absolute minimum of 100 hours of YouTube just understanding crypto. You know, when this regulation comes, I mean, the, you know, even Janet Yellen is talking about this, you know, Biden is talking about crypto regulations. It's going to happen. 100%. I see the the probability of this being a bull market, uh, as in the beginning of the bull market, incredibly low. However, Hey, Siam. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. Um, so can you kind of give the listeners just a quick kind of background as to who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, long story short, I used to be a Royal Air Force pilot um, and I've been trading and flying since I was 18. So I've always been wow. juggling the, 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 the two. Um, eventually trading one. I mean, the first sort of five or six years, I was losing hand over fist. It was absolutely horrendous. Um, and then ar around sort of year seven, I started to get good. And that's when I left the Air Force prematurely. I, I thought, ah, oh, I had a good like year or so. And I thought I was Billy Big Balls thinking I could retire on trading. And then I quit the Air Force and then quickly landed on my ass when I lost, <laughs> I lost everything on like a bad Classic. three months. Yeah. And, and then I, I was literally penny, yeah, penniless because I had uh, massively over leveraged myself, which is, yeah. So I went to, yeah, no job, no savings. And so I had to start again. And then around when I was about 25, 26, I got in into business because I, I realized like after probably year eight of trading, I, I realized I could actually trade, um, but I just didn't have the money, the, the capital to make it worthwhile. So yeah, I guess probably year eight, year nine, I realized I could easily grow an account, I don't know, or an average year would be either minus 5% or plus 20%. Um, but I was just taking bigger hits because I didn't have the capital. So I thought, right, I need to just find a way to add zeros to my account. And the most logical way was, okay, I need to get into business. And business was literally that the, the sole reason was just to try and make my trading account bigger. And again, um, business was a, an absolute cluster mess for, to begin with. Like the first three or four projects didn't really work. But then once you get the hang of it, like anything, it's, I, everything is like a computer game. You just got to hit reset, don't cry, and just do it again. Just don't make the same mistake. And then um, thankfully, after a while, it got to the point where businesses started doing well. Um, and then I was basically putting all excess profits into trading and then trading was doing really well, really well. So, yeah. So ultimately, I'm just a mergers and acquisitions bloke that trades crypto. Five to five, six years is a long time of kind of losing money, but persevering. Yeah. How um. What was like, what was yeah. going through? Like how, one, what, what was kind of like your routine? Was it kind of like those like, Late nights, you're like, oh shit, like, I've got to make this money back. Or like, how much were you trading and what kept you going? Yeah, I, so on base, I was known as the, the degenerate gambler. So <laughs> I was like a young officer. I was flying, you know, flying all over the place in, in the Air Force. It was, it was a good job, but my income wasn't that good. So th they don't pay well in the military. So I was earning, I was taking home £2,200 a month. Uh, I was blowing 200 quid a month on booze and partying. But back then in the officer's mess, you could buy a pint of beer for under a quid and a shot of dodgy vodka for about 10p a shot. So 200 quid got you a long way. And then I would blow two grand a month on, on trading. So literally, I would every single month for about it's an expensive at least, habit. <laughs> yeah, for at least four years, I blew two grand a month on the markets. But, you know, it, the, the time it took to blow, blow up an account extended and extended so you know 
Sometimes it would be a couple of months where I, it, I would blow up an account. Sometimes six to 12 months. And then and any month that I wasn't blowing up, I was just still adding the two grand a month in, into the account. So every blow up I got, got bigger. So before, you know, it used to be just a two grand blow up again. But then eventually, the, I remember one point, I was doing well for a fair while. I, I turned like a 10 grand account into an 80 grand account. I then blew 20 grand trying to make it even more. And then I, I sat there with 60 grand and I thought, right, I need to cut and run my profits. And then I bought an Aston. So I was this stupid 23 year old <laughs> oh, no. driving an Aston around the base with, oh God. As it slowly devalues as well. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah, crazy. Yeah. What was the, uh, what kind of like, what took you, what, what do you think was most responsible for like the rate of change from, slowly losing less 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 and then actually making money yeah just not doing the same mistakes um now it's easier said than done and i did many mistakes multiple times but eventually no matter how stupid you are and i was stupid um you'll learn that okay every time i click the button when the charts are doing this i lose money let's just not click that button this time um mm. and so learning not to take a trade is is crucial by not taking a, a trade that is a trade in itself it's basically you saying being in cash or being out of the market is better than being in the market at the moment um, when the prob probabilities don't add up so i i learned that taking asymmet asymmetric trades are the way forward for, for my style so what i mean by that is um i don't give a shit about the hit rate so like any new trader especially me to begin with, was obsessed with hit rate. You know, I need to be 90% accurate, 80% accurate, all that. But it's, it's rubbish. I mean, I could pluck out a brand new system out of my ass right now, right here, and it would be 95% accurate, but it wouldn't be, it would have negative expectancy. Uh, it would be a losing mm. system. Uh, and so you see all these scammers online and, um, you know, copy traders, or whatever, and they, they put, they do these stupid martingale type strategies where, yeah, they've got a 90 to 95 percent hit rate but they're effectively you know taking the snatching profits at you know 10 pips of profit and having no stop loss or you know or, or a thousand pip stop loss or, or whatever so yeah you, you'll win all you know all those teeny weeny trades but there'll be one trade that'll blow up the whole account and yeah so in terms of asymmetric trades what I, what I mean by that is that when i win i win big so it sounds very gambling, but it's, it's not, it's, um, yeah, there's a million ways to trade. Um, so just like in business, you could be a orange juice salesperson or a, you know, a tech person. There's so many different things. Hmm. So. so it's what you say about kind of the importance of saying no to a trade. Cause I guess like, mm -hmm. well, similar to life as well, like you only have so much time, so much energy and like in your trading account, you only have so much money. And so it's kind of picking your bets and where to actually allocate your money and where to actually allocate your time is much more important than trying to put your fingers in like as many things as you can to try and benefit from all of them. And then I guess kind of choosing the best ones. What kind of, what yeah. characteristics, were there certain characteristics about a trade that you were like, this is the one I got to go heavy? Or was it kind of, there would be a lot of them, but you just manage your risk <clears> and you kind of, you'd go for a lot. And then when you did have one, you just let it run. So, yeah, that, that's quite a big question, actually. So, first of all, um, it's important to understand the, the difference between probability of a move happening and your confidence um, of a move. They're two separate things. So, uh, sometimes people, I, I see people that are like so damn confident that something's going to happen, but they're mistaking their enthusiasm for probability because mm. they're so enthusiastic about this move about to happen they think oh yeah the market's nine you know definitely gonna also move but so you have to separate those things and you have to i look for low risk high probability outcome trades so um for those that are listening to this in the future today is the 19th of january uh, 2023 and we are currently sat in the on the back end of a, a little rally in crypto so um <clears throat> So ETH has gone up, I don't know, uh, 30. In fact, let's just quickly double check here. So from the recent lows to, to now, ETH has gone up about 32%. Bitcoin has done about the same. 
Now, the reason I say this is that very recently, literally in the last couple of weeks, it seems from looking at Twitter and YouTube, everyone has just gone suddenly bullish. Everyone think, is thinking, oh, this is the end of the bear market. This is the bull market. You know, we had a you know, big, sharp rise to the upside. And and I, I am personally um, extremely bearish at the moment, short term. So I see the the probability of this being a bull market uh, as in the beginning of the bull market incredibly low however so that's what what i think the probability of the market is what is my confidence of that i would say only say 70 percent. so the uh, uh, unfortunately it's hard to i think it just comes down to experience in terms of where my um confidence rating and also probability of the market is and the funny thing is, if you go back a couple of weeks, everyone was bearish, like crazy bearish. And then just like that, people just flipped to bullish. Just like, mm. uh, And so I think you have to look at the bigger picture. So everyone's, you know, look at the charts and look at these, you know, they're, they're stretching, you know, the charts in the vertical sense. and Doing circles. Big... <laughs> yeah. And, and it's like, just zoom out. So if you like look at, say, ETH or Bitcoin on the, say, the daily chart, and then pull back uh, yeah, and just zoom out a bit, you'll realize that this is this is more likely to be a fake out than anything. Um, and so when looking at a position, so you, unfortunately with crypto, you have to do, you have to look at other things, um, not just the charts, because I've been a currency trader. So I, I used to trade the majors, majors and minors for, oh Jesus, at least 18 years now. Um, and so you could really just be a technical trader with trading, you know, euro dollar cable, all that sort of stuff. But with crypto, because it's so small a market, um, and to put that in perspective, crypto is less than it will, less than a trillion dollar market cap, whereas currencies are a 1.6 quadrillion dollar market, quadrillion. Uh, <laughs> so it's pretty much number. only central banks. Yeah, only central banks can really you know, spoof the, the currency markets pretty much. Whereas crypto, anything, I mean, Elon could just make a tweet about Doge and then Doge doubles. Um, so, so for example, at the moment, at the end, at the end of this month, we have a high volatility um, situation where we have earnings calls for the, the FANG TM stock. So Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, Tesla, Microsoft, like the, you know, the big seven. Um, they're unlikely to look that rosier, I think. Um, we have interest rates, we have FOMC meetings, you know, inflation, like like between sort of the 25th of Jan to sort of the 5th of Feb, we have so many earnings calls and news announcements and stuff like that. And I think this, and I said this before this rally happened, we are likely to have a, a, a bit of a fake out into the end of the month and then slam back down. Um, so... Yeah, that didn't really answer your question, did it? <laughs> uh, I can't even remember what my question was anymore. Um, yeah. but no, I mean, everything you said there, super, super interesting. Because as you say, people have kind of switched bullish so quickly. People like the Fed is kind of peak hawkish. Um, and the kind of people are floating the pivot around already. Um, but I guess even if they don't raise so much from here, it doesn't, mo doesn't mean they don't keep it there for a while, which obviously has huge damaging effects on earnings and all these companies, which can bring things down. I guess like that's actually one of the questions I've been wondering is how do, say, earnings falling for companies and that coming down, how does that affect the crypto world and Bitcoin? Because I mean, say Bitcoin, for example, it obviously doesn't have any earnings, but it'll probably mm. still be dragged down somewhat. I mean, yeah, what are your... You obviously, I guess you think that it'll kind of all come down together. Yes, unfortunately, crypto has a roughly an 80 to a 90 percent correlation with stocks. So it's not in it in its own sort of vacuum. Mm. Uh, pretty much if you if you compare the charts, Bitcoin has done just well. It, stocks have been crashing since the beginning of 2022 and it's just dragged crypto with it. And what a lot of people don't realize is that if you just look at the the companies um like the big companies that we know of they fired they literally made over a mm. hundred thousand people redundant last last year that's a hundred thousand people that are now struggling to pay their mortgage or 
or whatnot. And well, actually not just yet, because all of those people most likely had a nice payout, you know, three to six months worth of salary, blah, blah, blah. So the pain hasn't really hit in yet. Uh, but the and I I don't I don't, I don't really trust the unemployment figures that the US um, includes because the way they they do their stats is 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 very silly. Like, for example, if you um, this is not exact. I, I, it's been a while since I read up on this. But if you are made uh, jobless, um, you're then not made. So you're not counted as unemployed. You're only counted as unemployed if you ha if you been looking for a job for more than something like six months and still haven't got a job. And if and so you're you're then termed as like part time. Uh, or yeah, it's basically you have to like not have a job for a long time and not be looking for a job to be classed as unemployed, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, if you were to look at people, do you have a job? Yes or no? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, the, the stats would just be ridiculous. And so, yeah, you have to look at the knock-on effect. So every single time we've had um, oil spikes into a recession uh, and, and GDP starts to slow down and you then hike rates, you always have... A, a stock market crash always you had this in the mid 70s you had this in the, in the 90s um so what happens you have rising oil prices that hurts everyone because a country drinks oil like we 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 need water mm. um so when rising energy costs uh well when energy costs rise every country has to use a bigger percentage of their disposable income or their budget towards energy and it's the same as a human if, if we have rising living costs we then have to spend more you know more pounds or dollars per month towards food and living which means we then have less disposable income to buy shit coins um or, or whatever um or even so, consumer goods like just food going yeah, to a cafe exactly. coffee yeah people start it takes a while for habits to change um at, and when I say a while, it could be anywhere between three to 12 months for stuff to, you know, people to start slowly changing their habits, but also uh, governments. So what we're having right now is um, a bit of a, a lining up of the stars for, I think, what, what could be a mega takedown of, of, of stocks. Um, we, like, although a lot of the companies are still making profits, they're not making as much profits as they used to, we just have... Um, and and also the biggest thing completely is USM2, so the the currency supply. Never has the US currency supply ever contracted, ever, except now. So every single time we've had a, a crypto bear market and then the bull market is resumed, it's been in a currency expansion phase. So um, for those that are listening and don't have a chart, if you go to trading view and type in uh, what is it usm yeah usm2 you'll see the chart and basically it's it just goes up forever um and as of february 2022 the currency supply started contracting so we've never never experienced um anything where the currency supply has actually contracted um so to think that we can just like get into a quick bull market straight away. It, I mean, we've never seen this. This is literally un, uncharted waters. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's, it's nothing, isn't, um, what are the right words? I think it should, it should be expected because we, we printed trillions during the COVID crash. So I'm looking at this. So March, 2020, the U S currency supply went from 15.4 trillion and in the space of two years, it went to 21.74 trillion. Um, so just the US alone printed over $6 trillion, which is nuts. So to put that in perspective, um, if you can go from 2020 and then backwards, how long did it take to print another, you know, another, another 6 trillion? So basically, it went from 2012 to 2020 to print $6 trillion. And then we did it mm. another six trillion dollars in two years. And then before that, if you then look, woo, god damn. So it actually, yeah. So the previous six trillion dollars took from nineteen ninety eight. That's nuts. Bloody hell. 
So 1998 to 2012 to print six trillion dollars. It then took eight years to print another six trillion, and then two years to print another six trillion. Like um, the currency supply is in exponential growth, but now we're having a bit of a contraction. So if this does continue to contract, we've got an Armageddon on the, on the financial markets. Mm, I think that's but, such a good point. Yeah, I mean, to kind of for to for readers to better visualize it, it's like I quite like to think of like a monopoly game. And so, like, especially over COVID, the the banker threw in loads and loads and <laughs> loads of cash into this monopoly game. Here's 500, here's 500, here's 500. So all these yeah. property prices and stocks and all these things in this monopoly game rocketed, full open price, loads of liquidity. Now they're doing the opposite. They're like, oh, shit, we did that too much. There's too much inflation. We've got to start, yeah. actually, can we have some of that money back now? And so, yeah, as you say, the effects of that, because also with such low interest rates, there'll be a lot of, I guess a lot of people talk about like the zombie companies who aren't actually really making yeah. anything. They're kind of just living off of just taking on more debt because it's so cheap. And as soon as you say, as soon as they have to kind of reservice those debts at a higher interest rates and pay more, it's kind of, yeah, it's quite hard to really visualize or kind of get, try and think yeah. of the scale of what, what the effect of that actually is. Yeah. I mean, look at SPACs, special acquisition um, companies, they like during 2021 they flourished so if you just look at billionaire chamath palahipataya he alone set up 10 spacs um four of them i think he's just wound down and given them all the money back but when you look at the whole spac industry as a whole i think they're they're about 75 80 percent down it's not just cryptos that are down 80 you know 70 odd percent it's stocks that have, i mean if you look at stocks um Netflix. the s p 500 sorry netflix zoom uh yeah <laughs> yeah, these, exactly. yeah i mean just the, the s&p 500 from the first of january 2022 to the recent low it dropped 27 percent, which for stocks is huge um that, i mean that that's a huge drop for, for stocks um everything is falling and the oh god had, um ah oh, bugger i was gonna say something but i forgot but um that's all right. No, it's not lost me. Yeah, no worries. We're well, kind of. Down next, so you're up. obviously your like your three to twelve month view is kind of very bearish recession. I mean, one thing as well is yeah. I guess people argue is that often before the recession is over, kind of the bottom is in, especially for stocks. So, what's your yeah. kind of what's your long term view on kind of like where we are? Because I guess kind of bringing it to kind of Bitcoin and crypto as well. How do you? Yeah. Where's your, what's your, like your main framework for say the next year and then say the next three years and when things kind of resolves themselves and things turn around? Yeah. So when you look at the, say Bitcoin on the weekly chart on a, on the logarithmic chart, um, you can still see the cycles in play. So crypto, you know, um, it has the halving it then booms for a year. Uh, well, no, it has the halving and then about six months after it starts booming for a year. We then have a bear market for about a year and then a consolidatory market for about a year uh, and then, you know, in running into the halving. And then it, it's, it's clear as day when you look at it on the on the weekly chart. Now, the previous cycles have always been retail driven cycles. Um, that's no longer the, the next cycle will 100 percent be uh, an institutionally driven market. Retail won't, you know, will barely be anything because there are trillions of dollars earmarked for crypto. Um, I mean, BlackRock is trying to set up a spot to ETF, Grayscale, the Winklevi brothers. There's so many entities that are have literally apportioned huge chunks of money to get into crypto, but they can't do that. Um, and the reason being is that they don't know the rules of the game yet. So they're waiting for uh, the SEC to actually tell them, you know, here are the, you know, here is the bowling lane and this is what you're allowed to do. At the moment, there is no bowling lane. Um, and so you have loads of, um, big enterprise or, you know, just big companies that, you know, are willing to put one to 5% of their strategic reserves in crypto, a bit like Michael Saylor. Um, and Michael Saylor has got a lot of friends, by the way. So it's not just him and micro strategies that are trying to do it. He's got loads of business mates that, are, that want to do the same thing, but they're just waiting for regulation. They just want the SEC to tell them what they can and can't do. Once that happens, you then get the green light for all the spot ETFs all as a US-based spot 
Bitcoin ETFs and ETH ETFs, etc., then the money will flow in because all of these companies and entities, they're not going to dick about with a MetaMask wallet and, you know, buying Bitcoin from Binance and put it onto a wallet and then, you know, Trezors and all that sort of stuff. They just want custodials. They want a custodian, a bank to look after it for them. And also when these companies invest, they're not, they, they want exposure via sort of an insured way, so to speak. Well, insured is probably not the right word, but they want it via an ETF. So like most big mutual funds and what whatnot, they, they'll just buy trackers. That, that's what they want to do. They want to buy the Bitcoin ETF, not Bitcoin itself. Um, so we will not have a bull market until those two things happen. So we need those spot ETFs to come online. And that won't happen until we have um, SEC heavy regulation. So when you have that heavy regulation hammer just, in, just lingering over the whole market, like you, I think you have to be naive to think that, oh yeah, it's up, you know, back to back, you know, let's get back up to hundred K Bitcoin. It's not, it's not going to happen. The thing that will push crypto back, uh, you know, beyond hundred K are the institutions. So people are fearing regulation. I think they, sh they need to be excited about it, but understand that when it happens, most, most alts will die. Mm. Basically anything that, is a security I think is going to have big trouble. So that that includes any crypto project that did an ICO. Whoops, that's what like all of them, <laughs> including Ether. I mean, the, the CFTC, your, your big your big Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin is the only one that sails above it. And, and also, here's the other thing: whenever crypto emerges from a dark bear market, it's always Bitcoin that moves first. So Bitcoin always moves first. People feel a bit happy with their profits. They take some profits. They put it into the big alts. So let's say the top 50 alts. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's when alts start taking off like ETH, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah, just look, at, just look at what, if you look at the, B, uh, the ETH to Bitcoin chart uh, from you know, any, you know, any bear market from, <clears throat> well, from 2015 onwards, you'll see that Bitcoin always emerges first and then alts and then the shit coins. Um, so for now, for the next six to 12 months, I'm incredibly bearish. So I think we've got lower lows to happen. Um, and also the other thing is that like, if you're setting up a spot Bitcoin ETF and you want, let's say a $50 billion spot ETF, you have to go out and buy $50 billion worth of Bitcoin, right? Um, cause it's not a futures. Uh, ETF. So a spot ETF means if I'm going to sell $50 billion worth of Bitcoin, I need to go and buy that actual Bitcoin first. Now, if I was the head trader of I don't know, Goldman Sachs or whatever, and let's say Goldman wants to set up their own spot ETF, would I just like go, okay, I'll buy $50 billion at you know $21,000 where it is now? No, you wouldn't. You would smash the shit down as far as possible to make sure you got your $100 million bonuses. Um, and like... I would you yeah I would use every tool at my disposal to push this down to say 10k or or below it below it and then fill my boots because yeah so uh, yeah I, I I see a lot more falling so I think this year I, I'm calling it the year of regulation where you'll see you know 20 percent moves up and down all year long um so yeah I think we'll probably see a smackdown at the end of the month and then how low it goes I I don't know but uh, you, you'll see this choppiness for, for a fair while. Mm. So I'm just going to swing trade it. Some excellent, excellent points, I think, there. Because I feel like one thing people are always like, oh, have you seen this all? Or like, oh, it's a bear market now. I'm thinking of buying this coin or that coin. I'm like, well, like there's no point even thinking about it. Like, it doesn't matter who says it's going to do what X, Y, Z. Where we are right now, like, regardless if you think the bull market, the bear market is over or not, the first mover is Bitcoin and Bitcoin also bottoms before everything else. And like, even like yeah. when you look at ETH, like the ETH tsunami or like the big ETH rally came, it was the thing that ended the bull market. Like you don't, <laughs> you don't really need to, yeah, there's no point to think about. And then tying in like the regulation side as well, as you say, all of these coins, I mean, half of them were funded by all these kind of big VCs 
realizing, oh yeah. shit, there's a place here with no regulation. If we get someone who's good at marketing, we can kind of <laughs> basically make up this thing, say it does X, Y, Z, and then raise, hmm. raise basically liquidity really fast by, by selling these coins to all these retail investors who are like in it to make loads of money and then dump them, them straight afterwards because there's no regulation. Yeah. They can make so much money that that was kind of like, and it's not to say that there aren't projects out there which are doing really cool things or that might not do stuff, but knowing which ones those are and knowing which ones will or won't get hit by, as you say, the regulation hammer is like a task that, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if anyone can really predict that. Literally, if you did an ICO or an IDO, you are a security. <laughs> you, you literally tick all the boxes within, you know, the Howie test. And so I would be very, very wary because they will be coming. I mean, library just lost their court case against um, the SEC. So they're deemed a security and they've they're, they're been fined big time. ETH is a security. Um, they raised, what, $15 million back in 2015. Um, so, yeah, I... With that one, I, I have to under, I have to say there is a grey area in my understanding around ETH um, in that respect, because it is the golden child of Wall Street. ETH mm. it still is. So much big money has been invested into ETH, and there's so many big players out there that have ETH that like they want ETH to win. Mm. Um, I mean, you could even tr like link ETH all the way back to the World Economic Forum. And how you know the the work brigade and all that that you know they're, they're they're loving the fact that it's now POS, so proof of stake. It's way more centralized. I, I would say <laughs> ETH is like the most centralized coin out there at the moment. Now it's proof of stake. Um, and then you look at you know where where is that concentration of ownership in, in ETH? It's you know Lido and all these other big big players. And I'm like, well, like. Yeah, with human greed, you have to understand human greed, basically, for, for the markets. And there's so much vested interest in ETH doing well that I, I'm i a bit confused because technically, it's an, it, you know, when this regulation comes, I mean, the, you know, even Janet Yellen is talking about this. You know, Biden is talking about crypto regulations. It's going to happen 100 percent. Well, 99.9999% positive is going to happen. So what what will happen with ETH? How are they going to get a sort of get out of jail free card? So the CFTC has said it's not a security, which I find interesting, but that could just be easily overturned by the, I don't know. So all I'm, I'm confident is that Bitcoin just sails beyond all of that bullshit. Mm. Um, so it's the low risk, high probability play here. Mm. Why, why touch anything else at the moment? I remember reading a while ago, like someone, someone kind of saying like the, the super bullish case for ETH is that it is kind of taken under the wing of the government because you say the World Economic Forum like it, all these big Wall Street players like it, they have a lot of vested mm -hmm. interest in it and because of that, and they also like from, I think speaking to more people from the traditional finance or banking side, they like it because it offers a yield. Like they don't necessarily mm. like gold. They're like, oh, gold, Bitcoin, you, you can't get any yield off it. Why would I buy it kind of thing? Because you can get a yield off it and actually hold it. They instantly kind of like it more. So yeah, it's kind of more centralized, not necessarily in line with what it might have set out to do. But because of that, it's, yeah, potentially still a gray area is that it could almost do better, be super bullish because of all these factors. And then this whole kind of like yeah. ultrasound money narrative, blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean okay, maybe it's supply doesn't increase in supply, but at the same time, like the supply dynamics just changed, like after X years of existing, like there's nothing to say that, oh, after X years again, it could change again, which is the kind of less ultrasound part. Um, yeah, true. And and to be fair, the, the supply dynamics are really, really sexy for ETH now. Mm. Like issuance dropped to 98%. Um, and when activity picks up on the network, and you have more gas burning, uh, sorry, um, fee, is it base GUI burning, mm. basically. But like within a couple of years, I th yeah, I think I'm still super damn bullish on, on, on ETH, just not yet. Um, and you have to understand whenever you play with the issuance of a crypto, the results, uh, uh, so the effects of it don't happen straight away. So everyone, you know, always looks at Bitcoin for the halvening and they go, oh my God, we just had the halvening. And then it's like, come on, Bitcoin, do something. Well, the halvening, yeah, 
affects the, the issuance of Bitcoin, but the effects of that aren't seen until six to 12 months afterwards. So it takes time for that issuance to, to really filter into, you know, uh, the economics of crypto. Um, so now that the tokenomics of ETH are really, really awesome, um, we just need to, the market to pick up a bit, people to use the network a little bit more. Um, and it's good. You're seeing loads of layer twos like jump onto Bitcoin, uh, onto ETH. Polygon is is really leading the way there. Mm, yeah, um, they're doing a lot but, of stuff. Yeah, and, and also, here's the other thing, and you, you're spot on about the yield part when it comes to ETH. Now this is most likely going to be an institutionally driven market, not a retail market. You have a whole bunch of old, crusty white people, basically, now looking at crypto. You have Gen X and some some baby boomers that are now sat there with billions about to play with this new teeny weeny market. Now, you have to put yourself in the boots of these Gen X and above people and, and go, well, what sort of like investment training have they had? What are their, their you know, big black tar brush, stereotypical uh, investing methods? And they're old school, you know, I would say old school. They're, they're, yeah, they're like old school um, stock, you know, investors. So what do they, when they in, look at a stock to buy or a bond or an asset, whatever, how are they evaluating that stock? And it's standard, you know, stock analysis. Does it make profit? What's the PE ratio? What are, what are all these, you know, the old school, you know, generic stock metrics? So they, they're going to come to crypto and look at crypto with the same view. So what is one of the first things they're going to look at? Okay, which crypto has the highest revenue? Not fake revenue, real revenue, not like issuing tokens like um, DAOs, um, but what makes the most revenue? And if you go to tokenterminal.com, you can filter all crypto by actual real revenue generated. And ETH is like this massive bar and everything else is like right at the bottom. ETH makes billions per, or over a billion a year in actual re revenue. So they'll look at that and go, oh, okay. So it's like the second biggest crypto out there. It's the biggest revenue generated by Country Mile. It has the most full-time active devs on the planet compared to anything else. I mean, there's so many things going for ETH. So all these big boys will look at that and go, yep, I want that. Mm -hmm. but, the, other, the other thing as well and, is kind of like the ESG side as well, because they've switched to proof of stake, yeah. it's been branded as green, <laughs> good for the environment. Mm -hmm. And given that half the, most of the money in, in the world at the moment that goes into anything has to follow these kind of ESG guidelines, that has being been. one of the big reasons they can't, they might not even really be able to buy Bitcoin anyway, because it's still not regarded in that light yet. Um, so all of a sudden, all this money that maybe couldn't have gone into ETH before now can as well, because it's like, oh, it's environmentally friendly. It's kind of like, it's a green blockchain, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and the, the whole Bitcoin energy thing is such a crock of shit. It's silly, but that's a, a conversation for another time. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, maybe we'll take into that at the end. But um, I want to. One other thing I thought was interesting as well. You mentioned the supply dynamics like take a while to kind of filter through, and it kind of <clears throat> made me think of like if you take surfboards. Yeah. And if the if you decrease the su supply of surfboards in the winter, no one's yeah. really going to notice. It's not going to affect the price of surfboards that much because most people aren't I'm really buying analogy. surfboards. As soon as it comes to summer and people realize there's not that many surfboards there, that's when you really notice it kind of kicking in the yeah. price of surfboards go up. And the same is the same with the halving. Like just because the halvings happen, you still need everyone to come in and buy it. There's like you need the supply <laughs> and yeah. but you need the demand side as well. Um, so yeah, I yeah. thought that was really interesting. That's a really good analogy. I like that. I haven't heard that before. <laughs> no, I literally, yours? yeah, just just popped into my head. <laughs> I was like, that's interesting what you just said. I'm sure I could bring that to someone. All right. So you're the way you're kind of navigating this now, I guess. If someone was like, hey, hey, Siam, I want to get into crypto. I want to get some exposure to it. I guess you would say have a decent portion of cash and just slowly buy Bitcoin until the regulation clears up. Yeah, it depends on how sophisticated you're going to be on the markets and how active you are. Because most, like most people, don't have a clue how to trade or to or just to invest sensibly. Like, um, I, I don't think just blindly buying and then hodling is a good thing. I know everyone loves the word hodl, and yeah, the thing is, you have to understand when to hodl. You hodl during a bull market. 
you hodl during, I mean, let's say you've got your allocation right now. Yeah, you hodl during the con consolidation market. What you don't, you don't ever do is hodl during a bear market. And that's the thing where people always die. Um, so hodling is a good um, investment method, but in the right market condition. So for a newbie coming on right now, I like anything, I would say, spend a minimum, an absolute minimum of 100 hours of YouTube, just understanding crypto. Um, I mean, I recently bought COD, Modern Warfare 2, and I haven't played it in like six years because I banned myself. And, you know, just casually playing a couple of hours a night, you know, I've already clocked up like 800 hours of, on COD, just well, maybe not a couple of hours a night, but more. <laughs> but you know, eight hundred hours from, in a gaming for gamers is like pff, rookie numbers. But it hasn't really impacted my life. So, like, if you're new investigating anything, I mean, hell, I've 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 probably clocked up hundreds of hours just playing with Chat GPT three, uh, Mid Journey version four, and all these new AI tools, and like. Because I've got invested, because I've got an interest in it, and I want to get into that space. But most people, they'll spend maybe less than an hour learning about crypto or, or whatever, and then they'll just go and do some punts. So the really boring answer to the first answer is: you need to put the hours in. You need—I mean, YouTube is the best damn teacher on, on the planet. Um, just by watching that am amount of hours of stuff, you, it will teach you a bullshit detector in, in itself. And then you will know what I, I well, no, that's a bit too presumptuous. What I would say is I just, I would wait for, you know, pot potentially lower lows as in sub 15 K and then start to slowly meander in. Um, and then, yeah, pound cost average in to a degree. Um, but again, what I would do is different to what I would recommend a, a, a beginner. Um, mm. But yeah. It's kind it, of it's hard, yeah, because like YouTube's a double-edged sword at the same time. Because it's like what you, like what I found, what you consume is almost it's so important. And so like obviously, whenever you first people first yeah. get in, they're like, oh, I have an attack or crypto banter or Bitboy or this kind of yeah. stuff. And then like hopefully over time you shift more to like maybe Ben Cohen, Bob Lucas, these kind of people. But I feel like. I always find a lot of people still get stuck with, say, Bitpoil or something like that. And so it's almost yeah. like, although you might be consuming a lot of content, a lot of it like might not actually be helping you financially or to kind of gauge Correct. things better. So, I mean, what do you... Quality is important. Yeah, and so, like, but finding that's hard because like, even, like, say, someone like Ben Cohen, his content seems boring almost when you first see it because it's, like, low production quality. He doesn't really put that much... Out. So, I mean, like, how do you... Do you have any advice on people with that as well in terms of how to go about consuming content on YouTube? Or do you think it's a matter of like, you just have to watch it all, experience it, see who's right, see who's wrong, and you and then it's only through that kind of process that you kind of suss things out? I hate to say this, but it is a rite of passage. If you're getting into trading and investing, there are certain things you have to have done until you can become a, an experienced trader. You need to be scammed. Unfortunately, you need to have gone massively long on something and then, you know, lost it all. You need to have blown up several accounts. You need to have looked at someone on YouTube, tried to take their advice, go all in, all in on the random shit going that they're promoting and uh, get slapped in the face. I, it is a rite of passage. Now, I know that sounds horrendous, right? And I've gone through all that. Everyone has gone through that. That's the best damn lesson you'll ever get. And it's only once you go through that pain that you'll realize or that, that your bullshit detector gets stronger. Um, now, the I, I actually think it's really hard to unless you yeah, like you, you say, you land on someone that is actually, you know, realistic. Um, it, it, it is hard to not go through all of that. I mean, I'm even now it's 2023. I'm still getting emails every single week of people, oh, I've, I've, you know, just I've been caught up in a scam. I mean, in this day and age, you, you would have thought people have a better BS detector by now, but unfortunately people don't because, yeah, this is just a, you know, this is the wild, wild west still. Um, 
and you know you don't learn this at school so it's a hard one um i would like with anything you you should all like trying to improve the way that you think i think is is super important so if you're going into like a brand new space you need to find yeah watch all the videos from you know the sizzle sounds you know the people selling the sizzles so to speak bit, the bit boys of the world <laughs> and then also look at the boring people um and then you, when you have that sort of balanced view then you can hopefully make up your own decision but yeah it's mm. No, that's interesting. As you say, you kind of, there. it's almost like you just have to kind of start, get through it and kind of learn your way. Because as you say, someone can tell you something, but you're probably not going to listen to it until you've actually Correct. felt the ramifications of whatever it is they're telling you. And it's almost yeah. kind of, yeah, you just have to kind of feel it out. It kind of brings me on to the kind of next section. I want to, you run a kind of school system education thing for like wealth generation. And can you kind of give me like a high level overview of like what that is and what you kind of, yeah, what's your, what's the general structure that you teach and recommend for people who do want to kind of build capital up and maybe a more risk averse way or kind of less risky way? Yeah. So I can only speak with authority on, I guess, one path up the, the wealth generation mountain. Okay. Everyone does it differently. Um, but I think the path that I have done and I'm on I think it's actually the most realistic way to get up there because ultimately wealth generation is maths. It's as simple as that. You have to first of all have a target of what you want to hit and then you need to find out the most logical and efficient way to get to that that target. And so you need to build in those mini stepping stones in order to get there. What most people have is through um, propaganda from the schools and unis is that they think that they can you know, you have to do well in school, get a good job or get good grades at uni to get a good job. And then if you get a really good job, you're going to, you know, be minted, etc. Well, I, I could litter you with the amount of very successful lawyers, accountants, engineers, fighter pilots who all have great jobs, but are miserable as shit. They hate their jobs. Uh, there's a saying in the Air Force, love being a pilot, hate flying. Um, <laughs> it, the, <laughs> Honestly, and it's the same with lawyers. It's the same with like, so unfortunately, what happens is the the world gets us into this this golden this golden trap where if you actually you know follow the rules and do well in school and get a good job, you then end up in a job you know forty to one hundred grand a year salary, and it's too peachy. And and by the way, your cost of your your living standards rise with your your salary. So. You know, you may meet a lawyer who's on, you know, 120 grand a year or whatever. They don't have that as disposable income. Their in their their lifestyle is probably 100 grand a year. Um, so, um, and again, if you meet someone that's on say 120 grand a year, you'd think, oh, it's 10 grand a month. No, <laughs> get rid of the taxes. That's 40 odd percent there gone. So, you know, they're not uh, they're not taking home 10 grand a month. They're taking home more like six grand a month. And then they're most likely living somewhere, and you know, and they've probably got three, four grand a month in outgoings. So, the <clears throat> so going back to sorry to the the high level, you need to find the vehicle that gets you to your target in the most efficient way. So, unfortunately, a job will never get you rich ever, like unless you're the point one percent where you you spend forty years becoming the CEO of a bank. Like it, it's the most inefficient way to hit your monetary targets. And let's say your money, you don't have to have like, you know, crazy billionaire goals. Let's say your target is, I, you know, I want 5 million in net worth, right? Are you going to get there in, in a job? No, you have to do it via an, a, a different means. And unfortunately, the most realistic way is actually business. You have to become a business owner. You And you then, and that's a whole rite of passage in itself. You have to become a business owner, a one man band, one woman band, and then your first bunch of projects or mini businesses will fail. Uh, but eventually when, and going back to maths, it's about hours, hours worked in your own vehicle. So I did a big study years and years ago of all the business owners that were retired. And that included, you know, Dave, the electrician, who's been an electrician for 30 years, but is now, you know, relatively minted to, you know, big CEOs, all that sort of stuff. And I realized I came, I found this, this sweet spot of 50,000 hours. 
if you put 50,000 hours of work into your own vehicle, you can semi-retire, pretty much. And so I thought, oh, okay, let's add this to my mental model of, you know, wealth generation. I thought, ah, so then it's a case of how do I get 50,000 hours of work into my own vehicle that is going towards my goal, not someone else's goal, my goal. And then it's like, okay, well, let's try and delegate. So if I'm, let's say you're, you know, you're a bit lazy and you're only doing 40 hours a week in your, your business. And let's say, well, yeah, let's say you've got you and a team of six. Um, so that's, that's seven people working in your business. Let's get my calculator out here. Sorry. So seven <laughs> times 40, that means it's 280 hours uh, a week. So 50,000 divided by 280, 178 weeks, divide that by 52. Yeah, that makes sense. 3.43 years. So if you have a team, if you have seven people putting 40 hours a week into your business, in three and a bit years, you should be able to semi-retire. And and actually, that makes perfect sense. I've, I've got, I've had, or I have a range of businesses of different profitabilities. And if you can get a business to making 20 grand a month profit, um, your, your, the, your life will change big time. Because if your business is clearing, as in netting 20 grand a month profit or EBIT, um, you'll be able to take out at least 10 grand a month of that and not hurt the business. So your business can still grow and you're still having a nice income. So there, you know, like your life will change very fast if all of a sudden you're taking 10, ha- 10 grand a month take home. Um, and yeah, so that stat actually, about three years, you know, to... Yeah, so in reality, it won't. I think it'll be a bit longer because it'll take you a while to get up to the stage where you've got seven people in your business, mm. uh, or you and six others, or whatever. So that may take. So yeah, actually, that may take a couple of years to get to that point. But then once you're at that point, and then you've got, you know, um, <clears throat> how what, what I forgot how many hours a week that was. Um, then yeah, most of my businesses actually started getting really profitable after about year five in personal experience. So yeah, that, that's the thing. And, and it's not the end of the story. So I, I meet a lot of business owners that have done very well in business and they've got, in, you know, they've got nice surplus cash flows in their business and personal life, but they have no freaking clue what to do with it. They don't know how to deploy it. And if you're in the UK or in the US, guess what? They go, oh, I'll just buy a house or I'll buy to let. Uh. Um <laughs> And, and they don't understand yield. I mean, if you do a buy to let these days, the at the, <laughs> the yield is just horrendous. Um, so you, you then have to learn how to deploy it properly. So, so the realistic trader, my community that you mentioned, is really tailored for um, business owners, no matter how small or big you are. Um, and then learning the other string to that or learning the other bow in, uh, sorry, arrow in your quiver, because wealth generation is not just one arrow in your quiver. You need a bunch. So one, one arrow is getting cash flowing, right? Getting profitable with your business. Two is then learning how to trade slash invest. And then, and then you can do a whole bunch of other stuff. So, but I think in, in experience, the easiest way, and it's not a quick way, it's, it's, it's a arduous route, but it's get good at business, and then at the same time, learn how to trade and invest. Because all I've ever done is take surplus cash flows, put them in the market, amplified it in the market, and then boom. Mm-hmm. And I've also done it the, way, the wrong way where I take surplus profits and then lose it all in the market. <laughs> so. <laughs> what part of the journey? Come into business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. But I think one people, I think one thing some people find really hard is like with starting a business, especially I think, People might, it's always like you have to have this like big idea. Like you got to think of some idea which is different or like, oh, maybe I'll like start up like an Uber, but for X, Y, Z or that kind of thing. How do you kind of reframe that and kind of guide people to be like, no, you can copy, say someone, what someone else does. Like, yeah. How do you frame that to your students? The, you do not need a big billion dollar idea. And even if you do somehow stumble across the next trillion dollar idea, you're going to ruin it. You're going to absolutely fall flat on your face. You are not the person that can... So you have, unfortunately, the big role models out there 
are not good role model models. So Elon Musk, Zuckerberg, all these you know big billionaires you know that we we all uh, hear of, they are not good role models. And I mean Elon's my god, but he is not a good role model to follow um, for an aspiring business owner. Um, so you have to just take a reality pill and go: Are you the type of person that can grow a multi-billion-dollar business like that? No, you're not. I'm not. Hell, I, I know my limitations. I'm definitely not. Um, and so you have to. Now, I don't want you to think small, but you have to do small to begin with, because there's so many things in business that you just have no clue about. Um, and I've seen time and time again in my own sort of ecosystem where I've had members of staff think they know it all. They leave to set up their own business. And then three years later, I see that they're back in a job because they've tried to set up it because they thought, oh, I know that my part of this, this job, it, it'll be easy. But what mo- the average person doesn't realize that in a business, when you're starting off, you are everything. You're the bookkeeper, the accountant, the sales manager, the, the customer relationship manager. You're the, the, the tea boy that you're you're literally the, the cleaner up at you. every role that there is in the business. That is you. Um, and then business is all about getting well yeah it's about getting customers customers obviously or clients they're they're better than customers um and then eventually palming off parts of your your job so you go from a one person band to slowly you know delegating all the bits of your 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 business so you you don't do anything um but the the thing that i see all the time and i've met quite a lot of people that suddenly go, oh, I want to get into business. I'm not sure what, how, or I've got this idea, blah, blah, blah. I always go back to the question of how are you going to get customers? How are you going to make sales? Oh, no, it'll be fine. Once, once I do this, and I'm like, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. Um, how are you actually going to get a new customer? And no one pays any attention to that. So I, what I see time and time again is someone spending weeks, if not months, setting up their their business, their product or whatever, and then they go, right, I'm open. They put a Facebook post out there and then they expect the sales to come in. And guess what? Six months later, they've made no sales. Why? Because they've underestimated the hardest thing in business, which is getting cash flow, getting revenue. It's so hard. It's even harder now that ad advertising or marketing costs have just spiraled. So back in the day, I used to be able to just turn Facebook ads on and money would just flow in. You can't do that anymore because of the Apple and Facebook fight. So cost per acquisition of a, of a client is has just gone up. So like, it's even harder if, you, if you're setting up a business with a low price point product. Um, so for example, if you were to sell a widget on Facebook right now via Facebook ads, a rough rule of thumb is that it's gonna cost you three times that price of your, of your product to get that customer. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is not an isolated thing. I, I've got optics on about 10 different businesses right now. And it's the same thing. If you have a subscription-based business. So, in fact, let's take my wife's business, for example. It's called myfairypenpal.com. So, it's a cool idea. It sends, you know, letters, to, uh, you know, uh, pen pal letters every two weeks in a big old pack, you know, to, to young girls every two weeks. And they can write back and all. It's, it's a cute business, right? Um even though it's fifteen pounds a month, how much do you think it costs to basically buy a new customer? Well, Would going you? off that, something like I don't know, forty-five. Yeah, we would love that. We would. <laughs> she would absolutely love that. It's worse for subscription-based businesses, which a lot of people seem to be doing these days. Um, if I, if we were to turn on the ads again right now, it would cost between one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty pounds. Wow. To get, to get a new client, which means you're underwater basically a year. So all of a sudden, like if you have a subscription-based business, the, the, the CPA, the cost per acquisition is, is way higher than you think. So you then have to start thinking in terms of how long am I underwater for? So a rough rule of thumb with sub-businesses, you're going to be underwater for six to 12 months. So then it's a case of your, your client retention. How good are you, are you at keeping your clients? Uh, and if your client retention is lower than your acquisition rate, then it's game over. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty tough getting customers these days. Like, like I spoke with a, a, an old friend who 
she said she's worked in a PR company for ages and she wants to set up her own PR firm. I was like, yes, go you, you can do it. And then I walked her through it all. And she, she was just like dismissing all of the really important things like getting customers and doing this. She was like, no, no, no. If I just set up a limited company and I do this, I get a website and I do and basically do all the things which are completely irrelevant. You should not like setting up a limited company is like one of the last things you do. <laughs> mm. um, but yeah, and I was like, how are you going to get customers? And she was like, oh, it's right. I'll have my website and, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll just come. Look in. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and I, I spent about half an hour just trying to hammer in that question. How are you going to get customers? And then eventually, thankfully, I think she went, oh, yeah. Um, like setting up a website or a company is like set up a lemonade stand in the middle of the Sahara Desert. No one knows that you're there. Mm. So you need mechanisms to constantly and regularly drive leads. So it, again, it, like it all comes back to when you look at everything from a first principles thinking and everything can be done in a, in a logical sense. So how do you grow a business? You need sales, right? How do you get sales? You need leads. And obviously you'll then have a conversion rate from leads to, to, to sale. But then how do you get the leads? Well, there's either offline or online. Okay, so offline will be referrals and word of mouth, all that sort of stuff, which is not reliable. It's not predictable unless you come up with some sort of viral marketing campaign, which is harder than it sounds. Uh, so you're left with online. How are you generating leads online? And then there's a billion things you can do, but it's slow. It is slow unless you, you're in a, a niche where you can just turn on the Google ads and your product cost is quite, you know, is quite high. I mean, the easy thing is set up a business. Oh, don't bother with B2C. Like all the pain really um, is with B2C. Mm. So business to consumer. Like I want to sell this widget for $10, $10 on Etsy or drop shipping or whatever. And it's like, oh, it's easier just to set up a business. So B2B, so sending something to businesses and your product is a minimum of five grand. Mm. Done. Because then, you, so what if you're spending a grand or two grand to buy a client? It's fine, or even better, a service-based business to a business, you know, to for other businesses. What can you sell for, you know, three grand a month to a, a business? That that's way easier. Mm. Hell, then you could do really boring businesses. Like I'm going to be a commercial cleaning company, and I'm going to clean offices. Okay, and the contract is three grand a month. So what that means is, okay, for for a contract of three grand a month, I need to target businesses with between, I don't know, let's say you know, 100 to 1,000 staff or, or, or whatever. So now you've narrowed in who your niche is of, you know, of companies of a certain size. And then it's a case of, right, who is the, the decision maker? It's not the CEO. It won't be. It'll be someone, you know, normally, depending on what you're selling, really, it'll be the, you know, the CTO, the CFO or the, the, the HR director or whatever. Okay, so let's say it's HR director because it's, you know, training based how do I get in front of that person? It's not Facebook ads, it's not YouTube, it's not blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of the day, all the, the big successes in marketing that I've had from all my businesses have been off offline marketing. So lumpy mail. Can you send them a pack? Can you send them a little video brochure with, I know, 25 Mars bars just to get their attention? And then, uh, yeah, so, so I'm going off on one now, but I forgot what your question was. That's Sorry. interesting. Well, it was kind of, it was basically just how you frame starting a business, which I think you've you kind of answered. It seems almost like you got to learn to sell, really. Um, kind of mm -hmm. brings you, I don't know if you've read any of Naval or follow Naval Ravikant at all, but he's, he's basically yeah. like, you got to learn to sell and then maybe also learn to build. And then if you can do both, then you're off to the races <laughs> kind of thing. Um yeah. But so, I mean, yeah. And then kind of like, are there certain types of like boring business ideas? You are like, if you don't know what to do and you just want to, here's, here's something safe that you can just go do, figure it out. doesn't matter if it fails, doesn't have too much upfront cost. Are there any like templates of those that you generally advise? Not templates as such, but if you, so you're right. Learning to sell is the, the ickiest, like people just don't like to sell, do they? I still don't like selling because we have grown up in a, in a culture where selling is, you know, sleazy, isn't it? Mm. Um, the, but unfortunately, if you're going to get in, into business, you have to un find a way to do that. So because I don't like selling, I've actually built my business. So I, I never sell. I don't do any selling. It's just marketing that brings in leads and then we naturally convert the leads. But I would 
um, find a product that you really freaking like uh, and think that, you know, like from, from an existing business. So is there a product that you're using right now or that, you know, an online product or whatever? And then can you just sell it for them? Can you approach them and say, hey, look, I love your product. I think I can sell loads. Can I have some sort of deal like a JV or, you know, or an affiliate deal of some sort? Mm. Um, so like for, uh, there's no idea in, in particular. And unfortunately that's what everyone is looking for. It's like hit, can, give me a list of things I can do right now. And unfortunately it's, it's tough. I would, yeah. And again, it's that rite of passage. Mm. I would set up a small project, you know, and, ju and just try and sell something, even if it's just to go through the process of setting up a website, setting up the email, setting up the customer relationship manager, email type system, um, setting up Stripe to connect to your website. Um, and then all the automated emails when someone buys stuff. And then there's loads of stuff that people don't think about, like, oh, I'm just going to get a website. But a website's not just a, you know, a website. There's loads of stuff behind the scenes with a website. If someone buys something, you then need to send them to, you know, what's the checkout page, the, the thank you page? Is there a cross-sell or a side-sell page that you need to put on, onto that? Um, like, go through the motions of setting all of that up um, and then go through the process of not getting any sales and, and, <laughs> and, and just, yeah, it, it, it is... It is painful, like, and also look for for waves. Now I know this is a, a lot of people sort of don't like this, but it is a way that you can add some sort of tailwind behind you. Look at emerging trends, and then try and think of a business around that. Um, so, for example, I see over the next, starting from now, over the next couple of years, a massive AI hype bubble forming. As in, everyone is going to be talking about AI, Chat GPT three, Dali two, Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, all these like new tools that are uh, emerging. Everything is going to be an AI, AI, AI. Well, is there a way that you can use this new AI wave or and, and surf it for a bit? So, the <clears throat> the reason I've spent a lot of time doing um, just researching AI is because. Just for shits and giggles, I'm setting up a teeny weeny weeny uh, AI business, right? Just for me, this is just like fun and games. It's, it's nothing fancy because I just want to. <clears throat> I've got myself a little challenge of can I sell an AI business, an, a completely AI built business um, in a short period of time and sell it for like 50 grand, nothing much. And, and so what I've. Um, so like you can use chat GPT three to basically come up with imagine it's the world's cleverest person with all of humanity's knowledge in that person and that person is your slave that is what chat gpt3 is you can ask it anything um and so like here's a random idea you could set up an ai based youtube channel only focusing on ai type stuff have two to three minute long videos and you can go to ChatGPT3 and go, um, if I was to set up a AI-based YouTube video and I wanted 100 videos, what would be the, the best video titles for those 100 videos? Go. And it will just spit out 100 video titles. And then you go, okay, video title one is, um, I don't know, let's say it comes up with um, the AI landscape and what it means for businesses. You then type in, um, write me a 1500 word article on whatever that video title is <clears throat> done. It'll, it'll do it in seconds. And then you've got the script of, you know, the, the title and the script, and then you need to find an AI to voice thing. I mean, there's loads out there, Murph to speechify or whatever. And then you can just put that text into the, the, the text to speech thing and download that audio file. And then you can go to right now you need text to visual and there's some tools out there where you can put text in and it'll just make video based on the text. Um, so now you've got a, yeah. So now you've got a, a completely AI made video and I've already done a few of these. It's, it's pretty easy. And then you just put it on YouTube and then like turn on monetization and then you're going to get like no views to begin with. But if let's say you put a video out every day 
on AI, just AI and all the different AI tools and whatever, completely generated with all these AI tools, then you're going to get some um, traffic. And I know even I think if you get 5000 views on a video, you're going to get roughly 50 to 100 pounds. Um, so eventually it'll build up. So can you do that and get your YouTube channel making a grand a month? And if it's making a grand a month, you could sell that for 50k easy. Mm. So I don't know. That's just a random idea I've plucked out of my ass. Fun idea so. though. <laughs> Definitely given a, a lot of things for um, readers to work with. Which kind of I want to then transition on to then the second stage, which we've touched on a bit at the start, but kind of coming on to investing. And so you have some money you're looking to invest. Mm. You're obviously a trader, so I guess you kind of probably trade more than invest. But when say i don't know say you're advising someone or a friend and they're like i've got money but i'm not sure how to are you kind of like just stick it in some index <clears> funds <throat> and don't worry about it or you because i mean I that doesn't look like a good method for say like the next 10 years come in so yeah yeah what's yeah. your just from your face i kind of i wouldn't you just go ahead and kind of dive uh, straight into what you'd say a good rule of thumb is anything that is conventional wisdom is a crock of shit <laughs> nice like <laughs> mutual funds tracker oh my god I've made loads of YouTube videos of actually going through the maths of, you know, uh, two people, one doing the conventional route, blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it doesn't work these days. And again, you have to understand when to do it. So yeah, you could play with mutual funds and stuff, but are you doing it in, in the middle of a bull market or are you doing it in the middle of a bear market? Like people don't understand the difference between a bull and a bear market. And it's because they're one, they don't understand how to read a chart. And then when they do, people then suffer the, the consequences of dicking around on the five minute charts and the one hour charts and stuff like that. They're too closed in. So you really do need to stick to the daily charts really to get the, a nice big picture and then maybe execute on the four hour charts. But um, <clears throat> if you just like look at the daily chart and learn how to draw basic support and resistance levels, it will tell you when you're in a bull market and when you're out of a bear market. It's, it's pretty, it's as simple as that really. Um, but to an average person, I would say, okay, like make, like I, I normally, do, I've done it recently with a friend. I was like, okay, what asset classes do you think that are out there? And make a little list, you know, cash, um, stocks, bonds, commodities, crypto, property. They're like the main, you know, and then you can go into fine art, fine wine, all that sort of stuff. But you, most people can, you know, with a bit of nudging could come up with about 10 asset classes. And then you go and look through them. And I always try and give them um, a perspective of yield. What is the yield? So if you're going to put a thousand pounds into something, what is the annual yield you're going to get from that? Or what is the potential appreciation growth? What's the PAG? So Because sometimes you have an investment which has, has no yield, but has PAG. So as in it's going to go from you know $1 to $100 or, or whatever. Um, and there's, there's very few assets which have high PAG and high yield. Um, so ETH, in my opinion, is one of those unicorns. It has an incredibly high potential appreciation growth and it has high yield. And not only that, you can stake it. Not that, I, by the way, don't stake ETH. <laughs> not yet, at least. Uh, but you got the, you know, three whammies there. And so, <clears throat> but yeah, so, and when you look at it, you, you'll realize property, especially now is, whew, you should, like, no. Um, stocks, no. Uh, really, I'm, I'm a one track pony at the moment, Bitcoin, mm. literally like when you, when you think you are near the lows, um, by whatever metrics or gauging gauge gauge you're using, uh, buy Bitcoin and sit on it for at least five years. Cause over a th well, three to five years, cause over a three to five year period, you'll be able to see all phases of a cycle. So even if you're getting in at the top of a bull market in three to five years time, you'll be right, mm. typically. And Bitcoin and crypto or crypto as a whole, you're not buying a token, you're buying technology. That's the difference here. Crypto has the network effect going for it. So like, you had the tech bubble pop in 2000, 2001, right? Everything just went to zero, pretty much. Pets.com, all that sort of stuff. But what was the actual thing that emerged from that? It was the internet. That was the actual tech. Um, <clears throat> the internet didn't die, even though loads of people at the time said the internet would die. Well, here we are. Um, 
crypto is the same thing. Yeah, the, the the tokens will change, but really, what you're buying is like is the network. You're buying crypto, which, in my opinion, is as big as what the internet was, um, because we're moving into a world of tokenization. Like, regardless if you like crypto or not, or Bitcoin or whatever, I think you'll be a fool to not realize that the world finance at least and then later on everything else is moving into a world of tokenization everything will be tokenized literally everything now what i'm not saying is go and buy a stupid nft of a bored ape or a weird willy or whatever um <coughs> sorry weird way <laughs> is it mila kunis that sets that launched me weird whale oh, no, no, like, I don't even know. but yeah but everything will be tokenized to the point of houses like so, like, that is the trend, right? So you, crypto is the trend, or the, or at least the um, tokenization. And the, the, the most resilient thing in crypto at the moment is Bitcoin. Now, I think it's going to be here for a long freaking time. How long is ETH going to be around? I have no idea. Less than Bitcoin. Um, so for the average person, if they don't have any trading or investment skills, I would say, don't put all your eggs in Bitcoin, but, you know, put your whatever your investment pot is in Bitcoin and sit on it for three to five years and then work on your brain because it's your brain which is the, is the, the limiting factor here, as in knowledge. Mm. Buy Bitcoin. So, Interesting. Yeah. No, it sounds really boring. Cliche, doesn't it? Yeah, but I mean, boring is often good, isn't it? But I, want, I want to kind of come back to one thing you, you said earlier, which was kind of... You say hodl in a bull market, definitely don't hodl mm. in a bear market, but hodling and buying is okay in a consolidation market. That, mm. that, that sounds really good, but I think for a lot of people, that's a lot easier said than done. It's kind of, you're, you're very happy to hodl in a bull market because obviously prices are going up, but it's almost, I think, coming up with a plan or deciding when you stop that hodling in a bull market. How do you kind of, how do you navigate that? And how do you also tell other people to navigate that you. i can show you in a few minutes but so your listeners your viewers are they going to be podcast listeners or are they going to watch the video uh a bit of both because i can but, visually show you but i can you can show it as well to be fair and we can i guess kind of explain it but also just send people over to the video as well okay um can i share my screen i think you can can you see the share button yep yeah. click that click that click that can you see bitcoin right now uh it's loading <clears throat> ah yeah there we go sweet um <clears throat> right this is now for, for traders out there this is going to be really bone boring but for most people which is like 90 percent of the population this is the most effective thing you can learn right base support base resistance so i'm just gonna um, I want to keep this chart. Okay, I'm going to find a random chart, so a Bitcoin chart, which I have not doodled on. Um, try this one, Bitfinex, that'll do. So here I have, um, I've really zoomed out. This is Bitcoin on the daily chart. So every little candle is, is a day. Now, when I say base support, base resistance, all I'm doing is you're basically connecting the lows of a particular trend. Now, I mean, you could say, right, well, the hit there is a base support. You can see that this, this whole market has been resting on that line there. Um, you could also do it like that and say, okay, the market caterpillared up this level. Like, you can draw lines till the cows come home. I mean, the, the, there's resistance and support lines are all over the place. Like, I mean, there's definitely one over there. Like, now, the, the trick, and what most people end up doing when they first start getting into trading is that they start messing up their chart they'll go they'll get a bit carried away and they go oh my god this chart's here um and then and you'll you'll have a line of just absolute utter crap so what i would do is i would look at the big one so for example let's just say we're now back in 2020 and we've had basically a year of chop and it, by the way i think 2023 is going to be very similar to you know 2019 to 2021 just up and down up and down um shop but eventually the market will break out and and you'll see like looking at this there's there's definitely if you're to zoom out here some sort of lid on the market 
can you see that the the, the Bitcoin just can't you know get above twelve thousand dollars here, and then it crashes again, crashes, and then eventually it breaks out. So then you can think, okay, well we're, we're potentially in a, in a bull market here now. And then you can start getting in. Now, you will get in late. By the way, this is such a basic method. So you will get in late and you'll get out late. But it will look after you for the average Joe. So let's say you're, you're really late to the market and you start pound cost averaging in around here or dollar cost averaging in if you're elsewhere. And you're just going to ride this market. But as it's going up, you'll see um, you'll be able to draw certain trend lines. So you could draw that line and extend it, etc. So it goes up and you're like, oh my lord, this is just like going crazy. And obviously in real time, you'd be extending this, this up. And then as it goes up, you realize, okay, there's definitely a low there. I mean, if you didn't get scared out, good. So you think, actually, maybe the trend line is this one. Cool. And you, what you're just going to say to yourself is, I'm just going to hodl until this base support level is broken. And it goes up, it goes up, it goes up, it goes up. Sorry, obviously I can't extend it. Uh, oops. And it's it's effortless because it's like, has this line been breached? No. Okay, I'm just going to sit tight. It still goes up. Again, you can extend it. Yada, yada, yada. And then boom. Ah, shit. Okay, it's now broken it. Now, you wouldn't have reacted that cl that quickly. Or maybe some would have got out straight away. But let's just say you're lazy. You, you just forgot about your, your stash. And then one day you came back and you saw this and you thought, oh, okay. So it's broken it. It went back up. And this level, this is definitely, definitely broken. So let's say you're late to the party and it's like, oh, it's 46K. Well, you can either just, you know, be late and just exit here. Whoopsie. And what's happened? You've basically accumulated Bitcoin anywhere between 12 and 17 grand. And you've now got out at 47. I mean, that's a good day in most people's books. Or that's, that's a good play from basically there to there. You've locked in all of that profit. But as you're doing this, you can get a bit more, you know, fancy with your lines. And you can go, oh, actually, there is a clear neckline here between, you know, all this. And, when, you know, from a trading point of view, that's a that's a topping pattern like you've never seen. Uh, as in, like, it's as, a, as an epic sort of head and shoulders or a triple top of some sort. Um, and if that neckline is breached, then get out. Oh, okay. It breached. Let's get out. So guess what? I was, um, so I got out of crypto basically in uh, mid 2021. Once this level was breached at 50K, I got out. I, I, I And I, I turned from bullish to, well, I wasn't bearish, but I was like, I, I just went to cash just on very simple support and resistance levels here. And then you can do the same on, on the way down. So when do you get back in? Well, you got this level over here which you could have drawn, uh, or you could have drawn some, uh, if it's too steep, I, I, I would just ignore it. But, and then you just wait. So um, I I actually didn't get back into cryptos in sort of uh, mid July because of you know, the charts didn't look good, but I did see a mini boom. So I actually got into decentralized auto, um, autonomous organizations, DAOs, like early June 21, because the charts just look different. But long story short, Let's say you, you drew that trend line there. You would have missed out on all of this. But then let's say you got in late again. Okay, you get back in at 45k. Well, you're just going to ride the next trend line up, which is this one here. So yeah, you've been underwater a teeny bit. And then guess what? As soon as that level breaks again at 50, so you would have made a teeny weeny profit or break even, let's say, you're then out. And the, then guess, look, and I got out of crypto um and you can see all my youtube videos december january so december 2021 january 2022 i've been in i was in cash most of 2022 and then yeah so when do we get back into crypto well technically using this method you should be in it should because look it has breached base resistance so technically using this method you can you can pound cost average in now so technically anywhere around sort of 22K down to 15K. And yeah, so obviously I'm not doing that because I, I, I'm a trader and I, and I believe I can time it better. But if you're just, you know, the simplest investor ever long term and you definitely had money that you could park for three to five years, you can pat yourself on the back and accumulate anywhere between 20 to 
you know, 20 to 15K and you'll be all right. Because eventually the market is going to go back up. Um, d- does that make sense, mm, mate? Yeah, the, it's interesting what you said just, at the end as well. Because if we go back to 2018, 2019, like one thing I was going to say is, say like in that, in that area of time when it can't get above the lid, so to speak, if you yeah. don't see any other attractive place to put your money and say you've already invested in a bit in your business, isn't it necessarily yeah. advisable just to be buying in that region anyway? Because say you think you're in this consolidation period, you don't have anywhere else to put your money and you think it'll rise long term. You might as well DCA that yeah. instead of kind of like waiting, always kind of watch. Because that's like, say you're watching for yeah. a year, you might miss it. Like even if you have a reminder on, you might still miss it when it does break out or say you kind of switch off a bit. Um, and so yeah. like say now we're going into a similar phase like that where most of the price capitulation out the way and now it's basically just choppy sideways. I guess, and as you, we've kind of broken up that trend line as well, it's kind of, you would say, just if you're very simple, you don't want to do much, yeah, just put a bit of pennies and pounds in here and then wait for wait for things to go up again. Yeah, and I have to stress, what I just explained was like the most basic way that you could go about it, right? Um, you, you could be a, a lot fancier, um, obviously. Um, but, the, but that in general... It, I, I do use big base support to um, establish when I am bullish or bearish, you know, in terms of a of the bigger picture. I did exactly the same in 2017, 2018, where we had a crazy bull market in 2017. But ultimately, um, once we had breached that level there, um, and there was another one, I think it was this one here. Um, there were two levels. So I started getting concerned because we hit 19K. And then once we started fanning around sort of the, the 15, 16K area, I, I got a bit cautious. But at the time, there was a neck level here. Boom. It was that double top there. And I, I said to everyone at the time, if we break below sort of 12 and a half K, I'm, I'm out, out, out. Definitely, this is the end of the bull market. And it did. It busted. It did a Kobo, so a kiss off, bugger off. And that was the end of the bull market there, literally, um, from, from a technical perspective perspective that that neckline but yeah what you said about um pound cost averaging in during let's say the consolidation phase wherever that may be um the answer is yes but you have to always be analyzing the the different asset classes and looking for yield at at the same time so don't just blindly put it into bitcoin like always look you know is there another business i could buy or do or you know and although i'm not a big property fan for lots of different reasons I'm not pig-headed. Um, so every now and then, probably every six months, I will blank my mind and investigate property with an open mm. piece of paper, you know, nice. and go, right. And I, I challenge my own assumptions and stuff and go, right, has, has things changed? It's been six months or I'll probably do it every year. What, what has changed? Um, <clears throat> and then the answer is always the same. Um, the And do, do you mind if I just talk about houses quickly? Yeah, yeah, go for it. By all means. And like... And like the, and I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty because there's a million things you can do in property. And I, I have lots of rich property friends, by the way. And, but that's, you have to understand that if you're in property, you're not in property, you're in business. Ultimately, you are a business owner. Your, your widget is simply the, the property. Whether you're doing rent to rent, buy to let, commercial stuff, it, it doesn't matter. You are a business owner. Now, the reason I have never liked property is because I look at assets in real terms. And you need to do this with crypto, stocks, and and property. Now, how do you look at something in real terms? You look at the currency supply. So, for example, if you look at the US, that is the currency supply, right? It's just gone up forever. And so you can't just look at, you know, like the S&P 500 on its own and go, oh, wow, the S&P 500 is like the best performing thing ever, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not true because the currency supply has been expanding, you know, for, for many years. So... When you look at an asset, you have to compare it to the currency supply. Like to me, this is like the most basic first principles thinking ever, but no one, not even financial advisors are aware of this. So you have to say, okay, well, let's let's just zoom out here in the S&P 500. You know, what has the S&P 500 done um, since, you know, the the absolute low in 2009? Okay, so where it is right now is, you know, it's gone up roughly 525%. That sounds awesome. But what has the currency supply, what has the US currency supply done since 2009? Well, let's go and have a look. Well, it's gone from 2009, which is here, where is it? There, to here. 
Okay, it's gone up 160%. So actually, stocks have done better than the currency supply since 2009. So guess what? There was value. And on TradingView, you can actually chart this. You can literally go um, uh, SPX 500 divided by USM2. So you can use that tool there, divided by USM2, which is that one, and then enter. And then whoop de do. Oh, look, it's already here on my chart, sorry. <laughs> and it will actually show you what the stock market has done in comparison to the actual currency supply. So, yeah, from the lows of 2009, there have been value. There has been value. But, but here's the thing. There has been a lost generation in wealth, which no one really realizes. Because if you look at... So this is real, the real wealth, the, the real value chart. Because stocks actually plummeted in value from 2000 to 2009 in real terms now now you understand the concept let's take this to houses so i'm in the uk so sorry if you're in america but i've only got the chance for the uk here so this is the uh the uk house pricing index <clears throat> so everyone looks at this and goes oh wow how you know buy a house you know houses have just gone up forever because they just look at silly charts like, oh, my, I bought a house for 100 grand back in the day and it's now 500 grand. I've, uh, I'm Billy Big Balls. I made loads of profit. But <clears throat> so what happens when you compare this to the UK M2 supply? Well, I'll cut to the chase. This is what UK house prices have done since 1987. Mm. When you look at this chart, you, you like this is proof. You have actually lost money. If you bought a house in 1987, you are massively underwater right now. Um, now, it's hard for the average Joe to get their head around that because they'll be like, oh, in 1990, I bought a house for 50 grand and it's worth 500 grand. Yes, but the currency supply has gone exponential since then. So <clears throat> you have to understand timing. So, um, yeah, if you bought a house in 2004 and then sold it in 2011, you would have lost a shit ton of real value. But there are... It, it, you 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 could time it so for example if you bought a house in 2011 and then sold it in 2016 you would have made a real value return and if you're renting um, it out 20 so if you're renting it out yeah correct yeah so um i'm not just um shaming property as a whole niche it's all i'm saying is that as an investor you have to be slightly more sophisticated than the average Dave down the pub. Mm. Does that make sense? And I'm sorry, Dave down the pub, but you know nothing. <laughs> um, and so, um, when I look at these charts using very, this is very, this is this is absolute basics, really. You can still do technical analysis on real value charts. I call it a real value chart. And guess what? We've hit a bit of a lid here. Um, and with the way that things are going, I, I actually see property prices or the value of property crashing against the currency supply. So when I look at this and now what now, by the way, house prices could stay the same, but the, the currency supply could explode. So, for example, let's say today, right now, the Bank of England goes, oh, screw this. We're going to turn the printing presses on. And over the next year, we're going to print 100 percent. As in, we're going to double the UK currency supply. Well, what would happen on this chart is this. Whoop. Oh, sorry, no, the other way around. So, whoop. Because <laughs> the currency supply would have doubled, but house prices would have stayed the same. Because there's always that lag between print, you know, expanding the currency supply and that filtering down into, um, into you know, assets. So straight away, and by the way, this is what I actually see happening. At some point, there'll be a pivot this year you know, stock market crash, whatever. Let's just print our way out into oblivion because that's what all the central banks and governments ever do. We can see a situation where that happens. This chart, so house prices against currencies by will crash. But what do you think will happen in one to three years time when all of that funny money has just entered the asset market? Mm. We could see something like that. Because where's that money going to go? We saw it in COVID. Everyone, you know, we printed shitloads and then it just all went into stocks didn't it mm. um <clears throat> so you got to look at real value so when i look at crypto um so if we do bitcoin let's just take bitcoin usd divided by usm2 
that is the real value chart of Bitcoin. <clears throat> so if you were to do that same old, it's the monthly chart, by the way, so it looks a bit messy. But So yeah, actually, when you're looking at the currency supply against Bitcoin and did the base support, base resistance, actually, we've reached it. So yeah, hodling, you know, accumulating now, yeah, you can pat yourself on the back over the next few years. Mm. But personally, as a trader, I think I can just squeeze out a bit more of a better entry. Um, so you've got to look at this. So yeah, this is why I've been massively into crypto since 2016, because look what's look, look what it's done. I mean, the picture may look the same, but look at the percentage growth, 4,000 and 4,500 percent in that mm. 2017 market. Or, you know, so yeah. Different numbers, really. That was my different scale. Yeah, so this is why I'm not in property. It's why I'm not in lots of things. And the only thing I'm in is business and crypto because they are the two things that consistently outpace currency expansion. Mm. One one other argument for property or an extra factor, I guess, is I yeah. guess the, the, the mortgage aspect. Because if you can take a mortgage out with a low fixed interest rate, then theoretically you can, I guess, almost get one up a bit on the money supply because the money supply itself is inflating away the debt, decreasing as to say it's a 30-year mortgage and you don't have to pay it. I guess that can kind of maybe switch it a bit to seem more attractive than it is without that. And then if you leverage that property again and you get one more using that and so you can kind of accumulate yeah. safe debt, um, do you think about that at all? Or, yeah. And is that kind of how you would maybe play a property crash if we were to see M2 expand quickly? Uh, yes. So again, you have to understand, like, because there's no set thing you can do for ev everyone. So what you've just said is slightly more sophisticated than Dave down the pub, mm. um, you know. So it, it then, but then I always go back to the seesaw, the risk to reward seesaw. And so, yeah, you could, you know, you get into property, whether it's, you know, B2C, B2C, or B2C or B2B, whatever. But I then, okay, what is the PAG and also what is the yield? Um, and that, you know, let's say going down that route, I could, you know, get X amount of money. But then compare that to crypto, I could spend, you know, that, that let's say the, the deposit you're going to put into this house, let's say it's a singular Also, house. just so people have forgotten, well, PAG is growth, right? Yeah. Potential appreciation growth, yeah. So, you know, let's say... Okay, yeah, let's say it's 2023 right now and you got 50 grand, right? And you're going to put that and you're weighing up property against crypto. So are you going to put that 50 grand into a deposit to get a house? And then, yeah, you're going to try and re-leverage it and refine six months and try and get some other properties and rent it out. And uh, hell, you can turn it into an HMO if you want. Or you know, I mean, all the sexy stuff that you can do with property, right? But ultimately, you've, you've expended 50 grand. What is the so let's say in five years time, when you add up all of the rental yield, all the all the PAG, all the what, whatever, what is the likely uh, um, upside to your 50K? Now, I don't know. I don't know what you're going to do. Um, you, only you can work that out <clears throat> using pessimistic numbers. But then you can think, say, well, wait, wait, why don't I just put 50 grand into Bitcoin or ETH or, you know, whatever, or an alt which is un unlikely to die? Or a bunch of them. How, you know, again, there's so many ways to do this, but let's just be simple. Let's say you buy 50 grand worth of uh, Bitcoin right now, and this is actually a lot easier to sort of work out. So, um, I'm just going to get a calculator here. So GBP to USD. So 50 grand is 61.770 in dollars, and Bitcoin right now is. Wait, um, yeah, where's my chart? Going? Sorry, I'm looking at Bitcoin. That's all right. Where's the chart? So 20. Here we go. So <clears throat> if we take that 50K, so it's 61,770. Come on, calculate. 61,770. Divide it by the price of Bitcoin right now, 27,040. So after fees, and so, let's just say 21K. And let's say you just YOLO all of it. You don't, you know, time it. You're just going to screw this, YOLO in. Well, you've now got 2.94 Bitcoin. So I've lost your face. Where is ah? Oh, there it is. Um, <clears throat> so, so right now you don't you you're you're not being smart or about this at all. You've just gone in 2.9414 BTC. 
And then you you'd basically just have to weigh up this compared to what is Bitcoin likely to do? Now, again, Bitcoin could say, you know, hell, I, I don't think it will, but it could say flat for the next 10 years. I don't think that's likely. But then you just have to work out, well, okay, if if Siam is correct and Siam sees at least 150K, and I'll show you why, one second, BTC, USD, if I go to the log chart on the weekly, you'll see that these cycles, Bitcoin is just, yeah, it's con ugh, area, I want my candles back, there we go. Um, <clears throat> the cycles are still there, and I think conservatively speaking, because we have, I mean, just think of this, we've got almost or trillions of dollars sat on the sidelines waiting to go into crypto, and not all of that's going into Bitcoin, obviously, I think a big portion of it will, but what is the, the supply dynamics of Bitcoin? I mean, there's only, what, 19.2 million Bitcoin in circulation. I think when you look at the HODL waves, uh, I think about 15, 16 million of that is all locked up. And that's a case of people losing crypto, people dying with their, their keys, all that sort of stuff. So there's really, I would say, three to four million Bitcoin in actual supply. As in circulating supply, that is actually, you, you can actually go and grab. So when you do the numbers of, and let's say, put 100 billion into crypto and, and over, let's say, 3 million of actual coins on the float, you can see some crazy growth, right? But let's just say 150K is a very, you know, worst case scenario, 150, well, in my worst case scenario, 150K Bitcoin in five years time. Well, 150K times 2.94, 150, 1, 2, 3. So that gives you 400, yeah, 441K uh, of dollars. Mm. So let's go back to pounds. So dollars, so 441, so 356K. So potentially. So you've got 356K. So the next question is, in five years' time, is your 50K in property likely to get you 356K in cash? Maybe. I don't know. Depends how clever you are at property um and then but there's so many ifs and that's what trading investing is all you're doing is back constantly doing these seesaws of if versus if mm. <laughs> that's it and then you've got to assign your probabilities and uh, yeah it's just a probabilities game mm. now i'm not going to tell you whether you know which one's going to win but personally um so if we go back down to the bigger picture of wealth generation, here's the thing. It actually shouldn't matter. So if we get rid of all this and you do the thing which I do, which is you have your bunch of businesses up here, so business up here. If you then put first order profits back into the business, so it makes, you know, let's say profits, you reinvest those profits back into the businesses. You then can take out your second order profit. So your real, you know, after you've reinvested in the business, any surplus profits, that is what I call second order profits. You can then put that into, you know, or let's say assets. So even if your trades go wrong, it doesn't matter because it is effectively free money. Mm. So you can afford to miss time or you can afford to go into the wrong asset. You um, and go, right, oh, I'm going to go all in the property. Learn a lesson and, and try again. Years. Yeah. Or do both and do your own split test. Mm. And like, I mean, there's no harm in doing both, is there? No. In fact, i will probably say do both because then you're going to learn loads in property and you're going to learn loads in, in crypto. Mm. Nice. You've got to find your own, own way. Just because I'm obsessed with business and crypto doesn't mean it's the way that everyone else should do. Yeah, it's just how you'd navigate it. With, with Bitcoin then... <laughs> Obviously, when you look at any investment, you're kind of you're doing this risk reward seesaw. What are the biggest mm. risks, or what are the kind of the scenarios that make you change your mind or be more cautious with Bitcoin, if there are any? Yeah, the biggest risk is actually you losing your own freaking crypto. <laughs> True. That is literally the biggest risk. <laughs> Whether you're going to be hacked or you just forget your seeds. And by the way, I've done that. I've, I've been hacked once and uh, and by the way when I say hacked actually hacked not putting in my bloody seed code into some random pop-up on a dodgy website 
And by the way, I've seen so many people do that. They they go they on a dodgy website and someone says, you know, or someone contacts them on Telegram or there's a pop-up going, to access this, you just need to put in the 24-word seed phrase from your MetaMask wallet or whatever. And they just do it. I'm like, why would you ever give so top t- tip, don't give anyone, anyone your seed phrase. Like that's, that's, that's a simple, easy rule to adhere. So yeah, for me, the, for me really, the risk is being hacked or losing your crypto, as in you just lose your seed and forget where you put them and, and I've, I've done that. Um, the, <clears throat> but let's say if we take that out of, the, out of the way, doomsday scenario for crypto would be, well, okay, this is going off the board one. The worst, worst case is a solar flare. <laughs> And not just that, but I, 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 actually, I'm thinking about this. All you need is one ledger to survive. And uh, so when you look at crypto from a, a, a fundamental perspective, <clears throat> it's nuclear proof. It really is. It's probably the only thing out there, which is the internet and crypto is literally the only, or maybe not the internet, but it is nuclear war proof because all humans could die out in a war or whatever. And aliens could come to Earth in the future and they and then they could stumble across this ledger and go, what is this ledger? Oh, it's Bitcoin. So even in a nuclear war or a solar flare, everyone could die. All that Bitcoin would need is one ledger to be intact on a thumb drive 10 miles underground mm. <laughs> or I, I don't know, or on a satellite probe somewhere. I, I, I don't know. So it is like. It is the, the freaking tardigrade of, of all assets. Um, whereas, yeah, the internet, you could take, technically, you could take out the internet. Um, there's basically you just got to take out the data centers and servers around the world. But I mean, that's hard. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so worst, worst, worst case scenario, solar flare destroys everything. But then you've got bigger problems like food and living and people trying to invade your house for food. Um, now, let's be more realistic. A lot of people talk about the regulatory. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's nice nice to explore these other scenarios and kind of just, I guess, hypothesize. Yeah. Well, this is the thing about first principle thinking. You've got to think, you basically just got to use logic to your best ability. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so you start with the biggest picture first. And that is, you said worst case scenario, mm. that, or that's it. Um the more realistic worst case scenario is some regulatory issue where um, because we all know, or hopefully or you should know that the world economic forum basically runs the world mm. these days in a bad um, way. So let's say, they, <laughs> yeah, in a bad way. Um, let's say they go all out war on Bitcoin and they ignore the facts and that Bitcoin isn't actually an energy whore. Um, like everyone thinks it is that yeah they they start smashing down on that and they go right we're going to ban bitcoin it's only only drug lords and criminals need bitcoin uh ether is actually our friendly one um but yeah let's say they they do a big crackdown like they did on tornado cash so what happened with tornado cash absolutely shat me up it sent the the heebie-jeebies down my spine. Are you familiar with what they did with yeah, Tornado Cash? Yeah, but kind of explain it. Explain it to readers because I think a lot of them won't, be, won't have followed it. So in essence, basically Tornado Cash was um, a privacy coin slash Tumblr uh, to a degree. So basically it was a way that you could hide cash, basically. Or you, you could launder money effectively. It was a privacy coin. Let's, let's just, just say that. It was a privacy coin, like Monero, um, but a bit different. And all of a sudden, OFAC decided to go, right, we're going to end it, end it. And they literally went scorched earth. They basically tagged every wallet that ever interacted with Tornado Cash and put sanctions on it. Uh, it was to the point where you had YouTube influencers that were randomly anonymously sent, you know, point yeah, one, one guy and celebrities sent like one little bit to all of these people. <laughs> Every, yeah, yeah. So someone, and I don't think as a guy, I reckon it was Team. a governmental department or some or some hacker group or, or whatever, just shits and giggles or, or maybe it's something else. But yeah, if you got any wallet that interacted with Tornado Cash was, was flagged up by OFAC and frozen effectively. Um, 
flagged and frozen and like to the point where the one of the developers of tornado cash is still in jail it's, it's horrendous mm. a developer of a privacy coin is in jail right now and that person basically didn't do anything whereas sam bankman fried is still in the bahamas sat on millions of dollars of other people's money mm. or his parents are where did his parents get that from ftx or almeda so like so they went scorched earth on tornado cash what is stopping them doing that with bitcoin nothing mm. they could do it if they wanted couldn't they in 1932 i think yeah roosevelt went all out on gold and banned the private ownership of gold uh and you had to hand in your gold to the local federal reserve um uh, station and receive federal reserve notes in in exchange uh, like they they could do that mm. again the prob i don't know the probability of that that happening I like with anything like dark world and whatnot, anything that is banned tends to flourish in the underworld, so to speak. And a lot of things that are banned actually grow in price. So in the US, they actually banned alcohol, didn't they? What happened to the price of alcohol during the abolition? It just went nuts. And all of a sudden it was a, it was the new thing that the mafia were <laughs> selling, you know, alcohol didn't just die it just stopped being legal and therefore it then just forced it down into you know the, the crime world so the honest answer i have for you mate is i, I don't know mm. no, nice. we can all theorize and speculate and, and whatnot but if if they went all out in war with bitcoin pff, i don't know yeah, well, it's it's hard because there's, there's, it's got that those anti fragile properties almost. Where if you beat it, it kind of just appears in other places. So yeah, you know, it's it's a generally tough question. I I only I only really ask it because it's something that I ask myself as well. It's like, what could it be? Because yeah. people are like, okay, so what's the kind of catch? And it, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to have a clear picture because as you say, even in the the bad scenarios, there are still other scenarios where it flourishes in the bad scenario. So it's a kind of, it's a tricky one to work yeah. out. <clears throat> can I, can I share what I think will probably most likely happen? Yeah. I don't think they'll go scorched earth on Bitcoin like they did with tornado cash. I think Bitcoin is an asset here to stay. Uh, the institutional world actually like Bitcoin, believe it or not. They see it as another asset that they can play with. It's a teeny weeny, you know, $1 trillion asset, which, you know, th th there's lots of profit for Wall Street to make here. Um, the other thing is that once Bitcoin um, or crypto as a whole, well, let, let, let's say Bit once Bitcoin gets over a $10 trillion market cap, it then becomes a mandatory asset for, for institutions. So lots of hedge funds and pension funds and blah, 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 blah. They will have, like, they will have to have an allocation, even if it's you know half a percent of their pot allocation into crypto, because once it goes beyond $10 trillion, it's then deemed as a major world-class asset. Mm. So that really is the floodgates when every pension fund on the planet has to, by their own trading mandates, put, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.5% of their pot into Bitcoin. I mean, that's absolutely nuts. But <clears throat> the, the realistic thing I see is that CBDCs spreading around the world like wildfire, like within the space of a couple of years, I mean, look how fast contactless technology spread across the world, you know, NFC, mm. contactless. That's how fast I think CBDCs will spread around the world. And people just, they won't know the difference, really. Um, and <clears throat> once we're in uh, DigiPound, DigiDollar, and the whole world is using CBDCs, there is no way to escape from an optics point of view. And I think they'll be like, oh, you, you want to spend... A thousand pounds on Bitcoin. Okay, we don't know what you're going to do with it or what you're going to buy with it. So we'll just tax you at source. We'll tax you up front instead of hoping you declare your profits in the future, mm. blah, blah, blah. So they may just go, Bitcoin, we don't recommend it. But if you're going to buy it, we'll just, there's a, I don't know, 25% tax up front. They'll probably try and tax the shit out of it in some countries. But all that, I think that'll be short sighted because all that will happen is go, well, wait a minute. People move, yeah. Barbados or Bahamas or Malta or this other country, Costa Rica. There's no tax. <laughs> Finance just moves. So, if, so yeah, taxes are a way that, it, it, yeah, that's going into a different thing. We're going to tax now, but 
I don't think Bitcoin's going to die realistically. I think they will try and poo poo it as much as possible, and then it will just turn into a, a ma- slowly into a world a major world asset, which yeah, you'll just get taxed heavily mm. whenever you buy it. Nice, amazing. Because once we're in CBDCs, they see everything. Mm. Which then, if anything, if well, if people are aware of it, or if kind of governments become more authoritarian with whatever power that is, kind of increases the use case value of the alternative as well. Agreed. Mm. Agreed. Nice. All right. So, like yourself, I do look at the worst case picture like regularly. At least once a month, I sit here at my desk thinking, "What am I missing here?" Because I'm basically going all in on crypto. So I need to see any bullets my way. And I, I, I keep coming to the same conclusion. Mm. So Well, I know we're coming up on your I'd time. Love... Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Well, no, no, it's all right. It's thank, thank you. It's been an um, amazing, amazing few hours. Where can, where's the best place for, kind of, um, for anyone to kind of find you or follow your work? Just YouTube. Um, I don't put much out. I'm not a YouTuber. Um, I, I refuse to be. <laughs> um, but I, I do put lots of... Uh, free stuff out on youtube um and if you like my stuff um i have a community called the realistic trader and that's it nice all right but yeah youtube yeah well, thank you it's been a pleasure speaking to you i hope you enjoyed that truly eye-opening conversation with siam as much as i did and here is the bit where i now remind you that we are holding a blockchain retreat on the 11th to the 14th of may where you will find fresh food yoga breath work sea swims, a sauna with a view of the sea, and of course, talks, panels, and workshops all are about the future of Bitcoin, crypto, and blockchain. Applications for the tickets will be going live in a few weeks, so make sure to register your interest for a chance of being one of the 100 people there. As a quick housekeeping note, there will not be an episode next week as we are busy with the ticket launch, so feel free to go back and watch some of the early episodes instead. Thank you for listening, and see you in two weeks.